Good morning. It's good to see everybody visiting and fellowshipping. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning, our members, our visitors. We have several visitors, Oklahoma, Texas, California, and if I miss some other state, pardon me, but I hope you feel welcome and loved in this congregation and glad to have you with us and you're an encouragement to us by being here with us, especially when you're out on vacation, traveling, whatever you're, you are doing. Members, thank you for being here. Uh, this morning before we open with a word of prayer. There's a couple of things uh, you need to know. We have an attendant nursery over here in the back, an attendant nursery, a nursery here at the back behind the office. So if you need those, uh, please feel free to do that. And there's some blue cards in front of you that uh, we'd like for you to fill out if you feel like it, just to see who you are, where you come from, and just get to know you a little bit. And please uh, hang around later so we can greet you and meet you if we haven't done already. And then uh, at such time, those cards that we picked up at the end of the service, and uh, one of our boys, uh, D'Angelo, is going to pick them up. Right, right, D'Angelo? Let's start with the word of prayer. Father, this morning we are grateful for your blessings. We're grateful for your presence here with us and that you welcome us. Thank you, Father, for everyone here this morning, all our members that are here, those that cannot be here with us. That's your blessing. Father, we thank you for our visitors. It's always a pleasure to see some new faces visiting our congregation, especially when they're out traveling and take the time to come to worship you and to worship with us. Father, we ask that you bless our service this morning as we sing praises to you. As we bring a lesson, Father, we ask that you guide our worship, and Father, we pray that everything we say and do will only glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you all. We're going to sing uh, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah for our first song. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name, praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim, all those together praise him, sun and moon and stars. And His glory is 
faithfulness. We're going to sing all three verses of this song and then we'll have our second prayer and our scripture reading after that. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow God, the only Almighty God. There is no other gods but you. Father, it's amazing in this life how we put things on pedestals, how we, as a society and as a people, make things our little gods. We know, Father, that each and every one of us will stand before your Son and give an account for what we've done in this life. And no matter what we thought was important in this life, if we miss the opportunity to bow our knees to you, to ask for forgiveness for our sins, 
to take advantage of the blood of Jesus Christ, then we'll have missed everything. We know that heaven will be for eternity, and this life is so short. Yes, we may have 70, 80, 90, 100 years, but Father, in eternity, that's nothing. We pray that you would give us sound minds and sound hearts to understand our position in this life. Yes, we have to work hard. Yes, we have to do those things that would increase our skills and capabilities, but we do it, Father, with a mind and a heart for your glory. Help us to do that. Help us to realize that we are here to be ambassadors for Christ, that no matter whether we're driving, no matter where we're sitting at home, at work, whatever, our attitudes, our words, and our actions should demonstrate a desire to love you and serve you and a commitment to honor your word and your will. Father, we pray that you'd help us as husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, to be the right example to our children, especially in the hard times, Father. We pray for this nation, that you would bless the leadership of this nation, that they would be wise and make laws that would honor your word and your will. Father, we pray that you would protect your people the world over. We know that there's chaos and that there's war and that there's all kinds of things happening. But Father, we know that you are in control. Help each and every one of us to fully submit our hearts and our minds, our lives to you. As you provide and protect for each and every one of us and provide and protect for each and one of the children the world over. Father, we know that we have sicknesses, we have loved ones that are hurting. We pray your blessings on, on our minds, our bodies, and our relatives as well, that you would give us the measure of health that we need to continue in this life, to be better, to serve you more. We're thankful for what you do for us. We're thankful for the things that you take away from us. Help us to have an attitude, a mind, and a heart. Always realize that there is no gods but you, and you are the only God, the almighty God. And Father, as we continue through the service today, as we enjoy the Lord's Supper and remember the sacrifice of your Son, as we sing, as we listen to a portion of your word brought to us, help us to put it into our minds and our hearts and to live it. We're thankful for all that you do. We pray that you would forgive our sins and help us to set our minds and our hearts on the right of truth and righteousness. That path, the path that leads to you, we're thankful for all that you do, and we pray that you would forgive our sins. These things we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand in reverence to the word. This reading comes from Matthew 16, 1-4, in whom we find the Pharisees and the Sadducees were approaching Jesus, requesting a sign, and the response is from the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said to them, When it is evening, you will say, It is fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be fall weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, and you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to them except the sign of the, through the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. You may be seated. Again, it's good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, we have visitors with us, as has already been mentioned, and uh, we're delighted that you chose to be here. It's kind of hard sometimes when you're out and about in a strange city finding a place to worship, and it takes time and effort, and then finding us at our building tucked away back here in the neighborhood, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time and effort to be with us this morning, and your presence encourages us, and hopefully your time spent with us this morning will be encouraging, will be encouraging to you. This past Thursday, we celebrated Independence Day, July the 4th, and many of you celebrated in various ways. You went to 
uh, barbecues, you would watch fireworks, uh, you attended parades, any other number of other celebrations. Some of you just stayed at home and enjoyed the day, uh, celebrated in all sorts of manners. 62 of us from here at Pikes Peak went out to Mike and Jerry Nelson's. We had barbecue and we had games and we had fellowship and we had a good time. Uh, started with the sign at the road, the COC party. And it was that, it was, it was a party. Uh, there were, again, said there were 62 of us who came out and enjoyed our time together. And these are just a few pictures I wanted to share with you of our time together out there. Boys being boys, digging in the dirt, not sure what they were looking for, but they were intent on whatever it was that was in that dirt. <clears throat> Other people sitting around visiting. Visiting and lounging. And those that were ready at the table before the food was started. Playing cornhole. I don't know who won that game, but it did not come to fisticuffs, so it was nice and peaceful. Kids playing soccer. And golf. And there were some baseballs involved in that, somehow. And lunch, of course, which was awesome. And then a rough game of horseshoes, which uh, I'm not sure who won that one, but uh, I think they won soundly in that contest. Three-legged race. Again, kids playing on the grass. Fellowship, talking, and a shameless plug of my new grandson, Ezra, and his holiday finery. Had to throw that one in there. So Independence Day, our celebrations were to commemorate the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. It was adopted unanimously by the 56 delegates of the Second Continental Congress. They convened in the Pennsylvania State House, which was later renamed Independence Hall, uh, in the colonial era capital of Philadelphia. And the Declaration of Independence explains to the world why these 13 colonies regarded themselves as independent, sovereign states no longer under British colonial rule. The Declaration of Independence wasn't actually signed until August the 2nd, but on July the 4th, 4th they made that Declaration of Independence. And we celebrate and declare our independence, but it would be eight years before independence was realized. That little thing called the War of Independence had to go on, and it took eight years for that to come uh, to an end. The War of Independence wouldn't end until September 3rd, 1787, eight years, four months, and 15 days later. Why don't we celebrate on September 3rd? I mean, that was the day the war was over. Why isn't that our big holiday celebration? Why don't we celebrate June the 21st which was when the new U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1788. Why don't we celebrate those dates? Well, I have an opinion, just my opinion, and you can take it as such. But when the colonies declared their independence, at that point, on that day, they considered themselves free. We are free. Yeah, they're going to fight for that independence, spend the next year, eight years fighting for that independence, but in their minds, when they declared themselves free, they were free. And eight years later, they would realize that they were truly free after the war was over. In Christ Jesus, we are free. Would you agree with that? Scripture says so. We better agree with that. In Christ Jesus, we are free. Free from what? Well, not free from governments, nor politics, nor treaties, nor nations, nor rule of law. All of those things are transient. Governments and nations and treaties and politics are ever-changing. In November, we'll have another ever-changing evolution of our politics here in the United States of America, depending on how that election goes. That's transitory. In January of 1869, the Republic of Izo was established. In Japan. 
151 days later, the Imperial Japanese Army rolled in and the Republic of Izo ceased to exist. Lasted 151 days. In 1885, the Provisional Government of Saskatchewan was established. It lasted 62 days. The Russian Democratic Federated Republic was established at noon on January the 19th, 1918. And by dinner time that night, it no longer existed as a republic. Those things are transitory. But we are in Christ the free from those things which have eternal consequences of sin and death. In Romans 8 and verse 2, we read, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. Made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 6 and verse 18, And having been set free from sin. Romans 6 and verse 22, Now having been set free from sin. Galatians 5 and verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. In Christ Jesus, we're free. Notice the wording of all those verses. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Has made me. Isn't that past tense? Doesn't that mean that it already happened? So when Paul was writing to the church at Rome, they had already realized their freedom. They already had that freedom. When did that freedom come? When did they achieve that freedom? Well, I think it's very clear from what Scripture teaches. When they repented of their sins, when they confessed Jesus, or confessed their belief in Jesus as their Lord, and when they were baptized to have their sins washed away, they achieved the freedom that we're talking about this morning. Day of Pentecost, Peter said, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In Acts 22 and verse 16, Ananias to Saul. Now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts, or Galatians 3 and verse 27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Colossians chapter 2 and verses 11 through 13, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your transgressions. When we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are free. Free from the law of sin and death. For the law of the spirit of life, again our text, in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death, Romans chapter 8 and verse 2. Today, if you're in Christ, you are free. You are free. Back up to verse 1 of Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our baptism... <coughs> to kind of keep with the theme of the July 4th holiday, our baptism is, in a sense, our declaration of independence. We're declaring that we are free from the burden that has plagued every human being that has ever lived since Adam and Eve. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. Our baptism frees us from that sin. And we can boldly declare at our baptism, I am free in Christ. We have freedom here and now. Just like those founding fathers on July 4, 1776 declared their freedom and felt they were free because they no longer were going to listen to what was coming from King George and everything out of Great Britain. We are now free. But it would take them eight grueling years to realize that freedom. Eight grueling years. When were you baptized? For those of you who have been. If you haven't been, just a suggestion, today would be a good day. But for those of you who already have, when were you baptized? I was baptized at the age of 13, which was what, only about 10 years ago, I think. And you're sitting out there saying, preacher, standing there lying in the pulpit. Okay, it was 48 years ago when I was baptized into Christ. 
I declared my independence from sin and death, and on the day you were baptized, you declared your independence from sin and death. And you say, but yeah, wait a minute, Kevin. How does this all work? It's one thing to talk about freedom and talk about being free, and yeah, now we have no condemnation in Christ Jesus, but don't I keep sinning after I'm baptized? The old John states, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. John is writing to what group of people? He's writing to Christians, to members of the church. Some 60 years after the church was established, and in effect he was saying they're still sinning. So how can I declare my freedom in Christ when I still sin? Aren't we free from sin and death? Didn't we say that earlier? Well, the answer is yes, we said that. Scripture says that. We are now free from sin and death. So how does all of that work? Well, when the Declaration of Independence was made, the colonists believed themselves to be free, but they had to fight for that freedom for eight years. Here's a parallel to think about. When I declare my freedom from sin and death at my baptism, I am free but I will spend the rest of my life fighting for that freedom because of that sin that we talk about that we keep doing and we keep committing in our lives. For the colonists, that freedom was realized again September 3rd, 1787. So when do we realize our freedom? When is it finally complete? When is it finally total? Yes, I'm free now. Paul said that in Romans 8 and verse 1. But when do I realize it completely? Well, the Bible has an answer for that. Now I saw a new heaven and a new, new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the waters of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's when our freedom is realized. Are we free right now? Well, according to Scripture, yes, we are. But we can't realize that freedom in its fullest until the day... We stand before God and using the words of the parable of the talent, and he says to us, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's Matthew 25 and verse 23. I am free now, but there's a freedom that's coming that will be complete and total, and that's what I'm looking forward to. So how does that work? How can I be from sin, be free from sin and death, and still commit sin? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We mentioned that one already, but notice what the next verse says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, there is the war for freedom that we've already claimed. The freedom we've already been given, but we're fighting for it because we keep sinning and we keep doing wrong. And yet, because of what Jesus has done for us, there is a mechanism whereby that sin can be taken care of. Add to that, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the sin bearer for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We declare 
our freedom from sin at death and our baptism. The rest of our lives we war against that sin that tries so desperately to get us. But in that warfare, we can confess our sins and know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from those sins. That's what we call freedom. Freedom in Christ. And not only that, but John says there, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ himself. I declare my freedom when I'm baptized. I fight the war of sin that wages against me, knowing that Jesus' blood is my shield and protection, knowing that one day my freedom will ultimately be realized in heaven. That's the beauty of the gospel. I'm not perfect. I can't be perfect. But Jesus has provided a way whereby that sin no longer enslaves me. And I can be literally and truly free right here and right now, looking forward to the time when there is ultimate freedom, when I stand before God and am in his presence in heaven. 1 John 2 and verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Do we keep those commandments perfectly? No. We talked about sin. But we know when we fail, we can confess that failure and have our failure forgiven. And then John does something interesting there. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light. Isn't that interesting that he goes from talking about sin and being confessing sin and the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us from our sins and then jumps right into the idea of he who loves his brother abides in the light. What does our loving our brother have to do with freedom? Well, as it turns out, it has a whole lot to do with freedom. Back to our 4th of July, July analogy. The colonies declared their independence and then there was eight years of war that fought, followed. But in order for that to end, in order for them to realize their ultimate freedom, ultimate freedom, they united together to fight, to wage war against Great Great Britain. What does the name Benedict Arnold mean to you? We all kind of know the history and the lore and the legend that's built up around him. His name is synonymous with betrayal and treason. He was not united with his brethren in their quest for the ultimate freedom from Great Britain, defected, went back and fought for the other side. You know, our war is not fought alone. We are fellow soldiers, all of us freed from sin and death striving together to assure that we realize the ultimate freedom when our Lord returns to take us home. But right now we're in the battle, and we need each other. We depend on each other. Just like the Continental Army depended on each other to win that war, we are fighting a war to win our freedom, ultimate freedom, in heaven. That's why the Hebrew writer says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. We need each other. We can't do it by ourselves, because by ourselves we are prey to he who would see our souls destroyed. Not us forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but the last part of that verse says, but encouraging one another. Encouraging one another. Twelve times in the New Testament we're told, love one another. And in this ongoing battle against sin, and the enemy that we have, who is Satan, we fight side by side as brothers and sisters in Christ, as fellow soldiers in Christ. We declare our freedom when we're baptized. We fight the war of sin that wages against us together at that word, knowing that Jesus' blood is our shield and protection, knowing that one day our freedom will be ultimately realized in heaven. And here's another thought about that freedom. Galatians 5 and verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What was Paul's response? 
Heaven forbid. That's not the way it works. We cannot use our freedom to become immoral people. We cannot use our freedom to abuse others. We cannot use our freedom to avoid our obligations, whether it be to our family or to the church or to God himself. We cannot use our freedom and sit around and do nothing. Our freedom requires action. Our freedom is not a license to sin. Old Testament parallel. The Exodus. Exodus 13 and verse 17, the Israelites were granted their freedom. God established the Passover feast the night before they left Egypt. In a sense, the day of the Exodus was their 4th of July, if we want to make a comparison. They were free. Free from Egypt. But just like the 13 colonies had to fight for their freedom, just as you and I had to fight for our freedom, Israel did too. And it would be 40 plus years before they would be independent in the land that had been promised so long ago to Abraham. So long ago. They had failed, sinned many times along the way, but ultimately they were established and secure in the promised land how was that accomplished? What lessons can we learn from that? Well, very simple. They succeeded when they followed God. They failed when they disobeyed God. Doesn't get any more complicated than that, does it? Obey, succeed, <clears throat> disobey, and fail. At Sinai, they became impatient for Moses to come down off the mountain, fell back to their base instincts, and built that golden calf. You ever become impatient with God? Don't ask you to raise your hand, but I can raise mine, and I'm sure all of you can too. If things aren't going the way I want them to, I want God to fix it, and I want Him to fix it right now. But James 5 and verse 7 says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Why? Because at the coming of the Lord is when I realize that ultimate freedom and enter into the heaven that's been prepared for me. Over and over, Israel complained about God, murmured against him, didn't like the quail, didn't like the man, didn't like the water, didn't like this, didn't like that. In Exodus 17, the Israelites complained about the lack of water at Rephidim. Numbers 11, they complained at Tibera over the lack of food. Numbers 14, they murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying they wished they had died in Egypt than be in the wilderness. They complained about God's leadership. If they weren't strong enough to enter into the promised land, do we ever murmur and complain against God when things aren't going the way we want them to? Philippians 2 and verse 14 says, Do all things without grumbling or complaining. In the book of Judges, we're told twice, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Have we ever been guilty of that? Do we ever decide that we know better than God what's part of our life and what should be a part of our life? Colossians 3 and verse 17, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything, everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Israel struggled in their freedom. We struggle in our freedom. But let's never take for granted the fact that we are free. That's an important thing to remember. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Slaves of righteousness. And yet free. Isn't that an interesting irony? But that's the beauty of being in Christ. Being slaves in Christ means we can be free. Being slaves to sin and death means we're never, ever free ever going to be free unless we're in Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are, are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. According to Paul, we are 
slaves who are free from sin and death, who should have no anxiety, who should be thankful, who should have peace, who know that our hearts and minds are guarded through Jesus, slaves whose life can be described as pure and lovely and of good report, lives of virtue, lives that are praiseworthy. And again, we stress, if you are in Christ Jesus right now, you are free. Yes, the battle is ongoing, but with Jesus' blood and his advocacy on our behalf, we can know here and now that we are free. So a closing question. For all of us. Are you free from sin and death this morning? Can you celebrate the forgiveness you received when you obeyed the gospel? Can you, in the struggles of daily life, have peace knowing that ultimate freedom awaits you when you stand before God on that great day that's coming? You can answer yes to that and celebrate your freedom. Enjoy your freedom. Be content and confident in your freedom. But if you find yourselves this morning still a slave to sin and death, we pray you do something about it this very day, this very moment. Let today, let this moment be the day that you declare your independence from sin and death. And you can do that now as together we stand and sing. Day it's our own care, our only and real. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Take the Lord's Supper, we'll have a chance to, uh, we'll sing, uh, I gave my life for thee, two verses.
Does everyone have the emblems for the Lord's Supper? If not, just please raise your hand and we'll have someone bring them to you. I'm not going to go over everything that I've thought about mentioning this morning for the Lord's Supper. The reason for that is Kevin beat me to a lot of what I was going to say. I was going to talk about our independence and how we gained our independence as individuals. But just a reminder that even though we are free from the law of sin and death... As Christ told the, the church of Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Be thou faithful unto death. Once we obey that gospel, we have to remain faithful to it. But I will remind you of another holiday that our nation uh, celebrates. It's called uh, Memorial Day. And it is an honor of those that paid the ultimate sacrifice for each and every us, one of us that we have the freedom to do. Being a combat veteran from the Vietnam conflict, I know what it's like. But we should remember also that there is one that paid that ultimate sacrifice for us too. And that was Christ. That is how we have gained that independence that we have today. I'd like to read to you about the greatest of all sacrifices. And I'm going to be reading out of Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 22. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often once since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, is it, and, it is, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of men. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Would you bow with me if we give thanks for the loaf? Father in heaven, we come before thee now, thanking thee so much for this privilege we have to partake of these emblems. Thankful, Father, for your love for us and Christ's love for us, that you sent him to die for us, and that he was willing to do your will, Father. We just pray now, Father, that we partake of this loaf, that we do so in remembrance of his body and the agonizing death that he suffered for each and every one of us. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. Again, let us pray. Father in heaven, once again, we approach our phone now as we continue with this memorial feast. We thank thee for this fruit of the vine, which we partake of now in remembrance of the blood of Christ that was shed on that cruel cross of Calvary. We just pray, Father, that we partake of it in a man of pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen.
I'll sing two verses of Sowing the Seed of the Kingdom, and then we'll have a prayer for the collection. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning, bright and fair? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the noonday's glare? For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's be done. Will your sheaves be many? Will you garner any for the gathering at the harvest home? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, all along the fertile way? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, you must reap at the last great day. For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Will your sheaves be many? Will you garner any for the gathering at the Separate and apart for the Lord's Supper, we have the opportunity and the privilege of return as we've been blessed by the Lord. You look on the monitor and you see the way that the elders have set up for us to be able to return to the Lord. There's collection baskets on the table in the back and here if you haven't done any of the technical ways. Then let us pray. Father, once again we approach thee, thanking thee so much for the blessings of life that we enjoy each and every day, Father. We just pray, Father, as we enjoy these blessings, we remember to keep thee first in all that we do. We pray now, Father, that we diligently search our hearts and give back to thee in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. We also have a tradition we started here at Pikes Peak Congregation for the little ones to be able to come forward and give an offering for the manual labor children's home. So young ones, if you would, come on up at this time and present your offerings. It is a be joyous. <laughs> Thank you for your voices and uh, joining in and singing. It's been beautiful. We're going to sing all three verses of Old Master, Let Me Walk With Thee, and then we'll have a closing prayer and some announcements. Mm. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee in lowly paths of service free. Tell me thy secret. Peace. 
that only thou canst give with thee, O Master, let me live. We have a closing prayer at this time. Bow with me, please. Father, once again, we are blessed and encouraged by your presence. Father, we're blessed and encouraged by the presence of each one here this morning, especially our visitors. And Father, we thank you for the lesson. And Father, we are so thankful for your word and the truth it represents. Father, bless us the rest of the day. And Father, we're so thankful that you listen to our prayers. And Father, we're thankful that you care for us and you ask that you continue to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>